All right, so look at uh, Titus chapter 1, verse number 5. It says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. The title for the sermon tonight uh, is Things That Are Wanting. Things That Are Wanting. And so as I've been telling you these, these last Wednesdays, I've been trying to preach sermons that I believe are important for us in light of uh, me going for the 12 months. I can't believe it's only two Sundays away and uh, the family will be going down to Sydney I'm, I'm saddened to just think about it. I don't really want, I don't really want to go, uh, but I know it's important. Hey, there are things that are wanting, okay? There are things that need to be taken care of, and that's why I wanted to preach this today. Um, even though, you know, it's, it's probably going to be similar to a previous sermon that I preached before, uh, but I will bring some other thoughts here. And the reason I want to cover this is just in case there is any, anybody, any family in this church that says, I don't think it's a good idea for Pastor Kevin to go down to Sydney. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's biblical. I think it's important that we look at the Scriptures once again, refresh our memories, see what the Bible says, and uh, let's, we build our actions and the things we do as a church from there. You know, I don't, I don't make a decision of going to Sydney for 12 months lightly. You know, first of all, it's something that requires a lot of effort, especially for our size family. Secondly, you know, I feel like I've invested so much time here over the last three years, you know, I, I want it to continue. You know, I want the next three years to be even better than the previous three years. I want this church to be on its up and up, you know, doing better than it ever has. And so, you know, I don't really like the thought of going, uh, but it's important that I do because as, as we see here, you know, when we look at verse number five there, Paul left Titus in Crete, okay, to set, thing, to set in order the things that are wanting. And then it says, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. And brethren, we find ourselves not in Crete, but we find ourselves in Australia. And I personally believe that every major city in Australia deserves a church like ours. I I truly believe that, okay? And this isn't something that I'm rushing to do. It's not like, you know, by the end of five years, we're going to have a church plan in Adelaide and in Perth and in Brisbane and in Melbourne. That's not what I'm saying. I'm expecting this this vision, this thought that I have, this goal that I have to be a lifelong commitment. I expect myself maybe going to the grave, putting that last church in place, you know, finally getting that job done. I don't know know what it's going to look like. Hey, I might not even accomplish it, but I think it's a great goal to have anyway. It's a great goal because people, you know, right now are listening to our online stream because they haven't got a good church to go to, you know, and, and there are brothers and sisters, if we truly love the brethren, we ought to love their need to have a good church, number one, but also the need for the gospel, for, for the, a local body of Christ to be in an area where the gospel can be preached and people can be saved. And so what does wanting mean? Like I said, the title for the sermon this evening is Things That Are Wanting. What does wanting mean? Well, the dictionary definition of wanting is lacking or absent. Lacking or absent. Deficient in some parts, thing or respect. And so Titus is in Crete because every city in Crete had something that was lacking, okay? Every city had something that uh, was absent. And Paul left Timothy, uh, uh, Titus there. He says, you've got to take care of the things that are wanting. You need to make sure it's all taken care of. You know, you don't need to turn there, but in James 1, 4, it says, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. Then it says this, wanting nothing wanting nothing that's my goal my goal is that new life baptist church would want nothing my goal is that blessed hope baptist church would want nothing my goal is that both our churches down in sydney up here would be perfect and entire that's what it means to want nothing means that it's perfect or it's complete and entire it's whole okay it's complete and it's whole wanting nothing And so when Paul has asked Titus to stay there, you know, and taking care of the things that are wanting, he says, look, you need to plug the holes. You need to make sure that it's entire. You need to make sure it's perfect, that it's complete, that it's done. And brethren, there's still a lot of work to be done in Sydney. And I would even say, I believe there's still a lot of work to be done here on the Sunshine Coast. But I believe that we're at a position where we can uh, set things, well, I can set things aside temporarily here. You know, uh, you know, I'll still be coming up. Hope, you know, the good, good news lately is that the, the borders in Queensland have opened up to northern New South Wales suburbs, uh, you know, towns. So, you know, that's just a good step forward. You know, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get up here 
every Wednesday as originally planned. I don't think October is going to be the month, but hopefully November or December, hopefully they'll open up to the rest of Sydney. And so my goal is, you know, like you guys know, to, to be up here. It's not to, uh, you know, let go of this church in any way. But when I, when I think of New Life Baptist Church, I, I do believe we have, you know, everything in place, er, everything important in place for this church, you know, to be pleasing to the, the Lord, to be serving the Lord. And, you know, some of those things that I believe we have in place is that we have church members that love the Lord. You know, I, I know uh, of, of a pastor who has a church, has church members that come, but they're not so committed to the church. They don't love the Lord. They don't love the, the church of God as much as I see the people in this church love, you know, this body and, and love the Lord. So, you know, we've got that in place. Number two, we've got soul winners. We've got people that every week, somebody's getting out there. You know, as a church, we get out there between services or other days of the week. We make sure that every week there is some soul winning getting done. It seems like every week there, is some, there are souls that are getting saved. Praise God. Look, we're not going to get the huge numbers in America that we see in America, you know, where they go to some Indian reservation. I, I get that. We're not going to see. I'd be surprised if we see 100 people get saved in one day. It could happen. It could happen, okay? But I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. You know, but it doesn't matter. If it's one, if it's two a week, we're plugging away. Those souls are going to be in heaven for all eternity. Praise God for that, you know? Hey, we have a variety of gifts you know, a lot of people in this church that can serve the local body in many ways. You know, everybody has something that they're willing to bring to the table and serve, you know. And uh, we've got that. We've got our own building. Praise God. What an answer to prayer. You know, we didn't even ask for a building from God. We just asked, can you give us somewhere else that we can meet on Sunday mornings? And God gave us that and gave us more. He gave us a place that we can meet whenever we like. We have the freedom. We have things established in this place. We now have the ability to live stream. You know, the finances have picked up and we were able to dedicate those finances to getting, you know, fixing up the PC and whatever, you know, the, the, the video camera. You know, now we've been able to reach other brothers, you know, other people uh, on YouTube. And I've been hearing from some of these people from time to time. You know, praise God. As I mentioned, the, our finances have increased. Our finances, you know, in this year, I don't know why, you know, people are supposed to have less work because of the pandemic, but somehow people are giving more and more to the church. Praise God. That's important. We'll look at that later, why that's important. You know, and we've had new members added to our church over, over the last few months. And it's not like, you know, we've had many new members join. Hey, but just a, a here, here, there, a little there, a little more. You know, it's more important to me that it's the right people. It's the right people that love the Lord, that are on board with what we're trying to do as a church, that are being added to this church. And not only that, guys, but within three years, and actually within the first year, New Life Baptist Church planted Blessed Hope Baptist Church. We've planted a church down in Sydney, okay? We've all done that. You've all helped in making that happen. That's an amazing thing. A lot of people don't even do that. We've been able, as a church, as a newer church, as a church that's not very large, to establish a church there, keep brothers and sisters together, and the soul winning that's going out there, are, you know, they're winning souls. That's thanks to what this church has been able to do. Now, I do think there is a piece missing in this church, but it's not much, there's not much we can do about it, okay? But we can pray about it. Of course, we can pray about it. And what I, what I would really like this church to have, for me to say, wow, this church is entire, you know, it's complete, it doesn't want anything, is a musician. I really want somebody who can play the piano, you know, well, someone that can play the guitar well. You know, there's a lot of young people, my kids, hey, there are other kids in this church, hey, you guys can learn instruments, maybe it's your, maybe that's your, you, you know, that's how you can serve the church. But, you know, instead of having the music off, off through the speakers, hey, having somebody play live, hey, that'll add a different, uh, you know, uh, environment to, to, the, to the songs and the praises. And again, we can have more flexibility if we have people that can learn instruments. That's something that I would like to do. Uh, but that's something we should be praying about. The Lord will open the doors for somebody, whether in this church to learn, or the Lord will bring someone here that can be that musician that we're looking for. But back to Titus chapter 1, verse 5 there. I want you to notice what was it that was wanting Okay, it says, For this cause I left there in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting. What was wanting? And ordain elders in every city. Okay, so this isn't something, it's not like, now it's important for us to ordain elders. There are two different ways that you can start a church. 
Number one, you've got somebody in your church that's ready to go to be a pastor. They're ready to go somebody somewhere. You know, they've got the, the, they've got the resources, they've got the financial backing, they've got the work, whatever it is, you know, to go to a place, start from scratch, and work their way into a church. That's one way to do things. That's basically how we started this church. You know, we were sent from Sydney, you know, we didn't have any kind of uh, financial backing to make that happen. Hey, but, you know, we, I had prepared myself to a point where I could come here, you know, and go without pay for a while. Eventually, those things got sorted. You know, we start from scratch, basically. That's one way to start a church. The second way to start a church is what we've done with Blessed Hope Baptist Church. We started a church down there. It doesn't have a pastor, but we have brethren that are gathering together. Well, I'm the pastor, but we don't, they don't have a full-time pastor there. Okay, and slowly that church will grow and that'll be easier for a man to step in there because he doesn't have to start from scratch. Okay, so that's another way. But what we're seeing here is that every city was wanting or lacking a pastor, was lacking an elder. What that tells me is that in these cities, in the, in the Isle of Crete, there were other churches. There were other churches already established Titus was looking after one church, but he was also overseeing other churches, kind of like I oversee Blessed Hope Baptist Church. But what was wanting, what was lacking, was elders in every city, elders in every church. And I'll show that to you later, why that's the case. But uh, if you can keep your finger there and go to Acts 14. Go to Acts 14. I just want to show you this. And I know we've looked at this passage before, but let's look at it again. Because again, I just want to make sure that you understand that the decision I'm making as a pastor is biblical. We see these things happen in the Bible, okay? It's not like I've just come up with my own crazy ideas, all right? If we do things in accordance to the Bible, then I know that God will bless, that God will take care of our every need. Acts 14, verse 21. Acts 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they, now notice the next words, they returned again to Lystra. So uh, the Apostle Paul here is going back to cities that he's already preached the gospel to, right? So they returned again to what are the cities? Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. So what does he do when he returns back to these cities? Verse number 22, confirming the souls of the disciples. So he's strengthening the group that's there, all right? And I'll show you that these were churches without pastors, Okay, so he's, he's confirming the disciples there and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God and when they had ordained them elders in every church. So did these churches exist before there were elders ordained? Absolutely. Okay, don't forget what a church is. It's a congregation of believers. These churches were started by Paul who was being sent by the church in Antioch. So he's already gone to these cities. He's already established churches. He's had people saved. Believers are coming together. Then he revisits those churches, strengthens them, and then he finds people that are ready to step up to be the pastor. And he ordains them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting and commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So to, to condemn is, uh, sorry, to commend is to, uh, to present, you know, as it were. They were presented to the Lord. They were given to the Lord, as it were. Okay? And these churches became now independent, completely independent from Paul and the church in Antioch. So what we see here, brethren, is we have these churches. Yes, Paul is overseen, and we've gone through this before, where Paul would leave certain men who could be preachers and leaders and things like that. Uh, and we have that situation in Sydney where we have a church plant. We have faithful people going there every week. You know, it's going strong. I, you know, I was kind of expecting things to drop off a little bit, you know, not having a full-time pastor, but it's still going strong. But there are things that are wanting. They need elders there. They need an elder there. And so it's important to go back, as we see with Paul here, going back, they returned again, you know, confirming the souls of the disciples and ordaining elders. Now, I don't know when we'll have that person in place. You know, it's just something I'm praying about. As long as we follow what we see in the Bible, as long as we see, uh, you know, we take care, we, we focus on the things that are wanting, we say, Lord, we need to take care of those things, then that's what we do. You know, starting Blessed Hope Baptist Church is the hardest thing, is the hardest church that we would ever start. Here's the thing. If, if, if Blessed Hope Baptist Church one day has its own pastor, both churches, you know, it's their own full-time pastors, it's going to be easier to start a third church. Because when you start that third church, you're going to be drawing resources 
from both churches. You're going to have men. You're going to have you know, the manpower. You're going to have the resource of two churches that can help get a third church started. Okay? But when we start one church from one church, you're using all the resources. You, you know, it falls on the shoulders of, 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 of one church to, to make sure that church has what it needs. Okay? But with both churches, the third church will be much easier. Hey, if we get a third church established and we look at a fourth church, well, now we have the, the manpower and the resource from three churches to get a fourth church, uh, church started. So you can see how the process can be a lot quicker, you know, as, as this, as this uh, starts to develop. You know, if we want to ordain uh, church uh, elders and, and, and start churches in every major city in Australia, it's going to eventually be like a snowball effect. You know, to get that first snowball, uh, you know, or avalanche effect, right? You just need a little bit of snow to fall, and a little bit more snow catches on, catches on, catches on. And before you know it, you've got an avalanche. And I would love nothing more than for Australia to experience an avalanche of soul winners, of churches that love the Lord, that are doing the works in these last days. All right? Now... What we, so what we notice there, so we, in, in Titus 1.5 where it says uh, things that are wanting and ordained elders in every city, what does this teach us? This teaches us even in the times, at the very beginning of the churches, and I believe this is still true today, there is a lack of pastors. There is a lack of, of men that, that either want that position or if they want that position, they're not doing what they can to achieve that. You know, maybe they're being entangled with other things and not focused on, on being that pastor. My hope, you know, my hope is one day we would have a man from this church that can pastor a church. My hope one day is that someone down in Blessed Hope Baptist Church can pastor a church. You know, I'm not expecting somebody to be just like me. I don't expect that at all. But, you know, we're still, uh, we're still not there yet. You know, we don't have that one individual that can step out and, and do this for, for, you know, a variety of reasons. Now, I hope if your desire is one day to be a pastor, that you work on these things. It's not going to happen for you if you don't start developing yourself, you know, start preparing your family, start loving the Lord, start making church and, and the work of God a major focus in your life. It's not going to happen, you know. So, there's a lack of pastors, there's a lack of elders, and this is why, you know, someone like Titus will end up with the responsibility of every city needing a pastor in their congregations. Well, you know what, I, I can't, you know, I, I'm at a stage in my life where I've, you know, my family's too large, I can't be that person that establishes a, a, a church in every city in Australia, because it required too much of my time. I'm thankful for what I, we've done now, it's been just right, you know, it's just, just enough to keep me busy enough with the church down in Sydney, and that's what I can do right now, but until that church is completely established, we can't take the next step just yet, okay? Things that are, are wanting. And so, as I said, you know, I don't have some, some crazy timeline. It is my personal goal for, for a church like ours, not a denomination, just a church like ours, that has a love for, for souls like, like ours, that has a love for doctrine like ours, to be in every city, but if it takes my whole life, it takes my whole life. And if I don't accomplish it, I hope the next generation or the other pastors in these other churches will make that their goal. Because we need that. We, we need it desperately in Australia. You know, there are a lot of IFB churches and there are still some good IFB churches out there. You know, if I, if I lived in Melbourne, I would, I would find an IFB church. If I didn't have this church, I would, I would find a good church there. I, I, honestly, I, I'm not expecting people to be just like me. I, I can respect and, and honor pastors that have been uh, serving the Lord for decades and for years, and they might not be just like us. You know, even if I was still in Sydney, I would still find a church that I know I can get plugged into. If I was in Melbourne, if I was in Adelaide, I'd find a church that I know I could be in and just put aside the differences that I know are going to be preached behind the pulpit. As long as they are brothers in the Lord and they're trying their, what they can to, to win the lost and, and to love the Lord, I can get behind that. But one thing I'm noticing, and so there are churches like that, but one thing that I've noticed over the last couple of, you know, last decade or so, is that IFB churches are, are no longer getting out there, knocking doors and preaching the gospel. You know, I, 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 I get feedback from people that I don't know, that live in other places in Australia, they've gone to their church and asked, hey, do you, do you do soul winning? Do you preach the gospel? Oh, we hand out tracts. Oh, we, we, you know, we, we invite, you know, people to our Christmas, you know, show, whatever they have, you know, and that's their way of winning souls. 
And it's getting, I don't, know what, I don't know why, I don't know what's happened, I don't know where it's dropped, but we need to make sure that there are people preaching the gospel in other cities. And I think, you know, New Life, because, you know, the last thing I want you to think is like, well, that's not our problem, Pastor Kevin. We're here on the Sunshine Coast. That's the problem of these other cities, of these other people out there. Well, how, how, how much will God reward us if we went to heaven and God says, because of New Life Baptist Church, you started Blessed Hope Baptist Church, there were all these people saved there, and you guys got a church down in Adelaide, you guys got started a church down in Melbourne, all these people got saved. How good would that be, going into heaven, knowing that a small church like New Life Baptist Church could have accomplished these things? I believe we can accomplish that. I believe, but it requires us to make sure that we take care of the wants the things that are lacking. And right now, you know, things are lacking down in Sydney. I need to get down there, okay? And it's not that it's a bad church. In fact, like I said, I'm surprised how strong they are going, you know, especially because they've not been able to have their... Pump. Maybe they do better without a pastor. I don't know. We'll see, how, we'll see what happens. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But, you know, uh, they, they're doing well. So it tells me if I could dedicate 12 months with them, how much better could that church get? I believe that church has a bright future. You know, I believe that church will one day help us start a third church. I truly believe that. Now, please go to, you're in Titus, so please go to Titus chapter 3 now. Titus chapter 3. Things that are wanting. Well, what are, what, what's wanting? Number one is a lack of pastors. Okay, that is wanting. There's a lack of pastors. Look at uh, Titus chapter 3 verse 12. Because the thought is, and uh, I, I, you know, I've had to sort of change my view about this a little bit, you know, over the last few months, you know, because when I came to New Life Baptist Church, I never wanted to go anywhere else, like for a period of time like that. It, it was never my, my goal, you know, and, and the reason why is because I would look at other men, start churches, be around for a while and leave and they never come back. And then that church just falls away. That church just falls apart. Or they end up ordaining some other pastor, some other man who's not qualified, who has no desire, but they got no choice but to ordain some random guy in the church. Okay? And so I I would look at those examples and I'd say, I never want to do that to the church. I never want to let them down. All right? But, you know, as I've been reading, because I'm a pastor, so, you know, and and we have the book of Titus and we have 1 and 2 Timothy. These are epistles written primarily to pastors. And so I spend a lot of my time in these epistles. <laughs> you know, uh, like these, these books are, are like my main reading now. I go over them again and again, reminding myself, what does God expect from a pastor? And when I look at both these books, I, don't, I, I see a pastor that's willing to travel. I see pastors that are willing to pick up their things, pick up their families, and go and help where the need is required. Amen. You know, to take care of things that are wanting. Look at Titus chapter 3. Verse 12. Now, before we read this, just remember, this is just two chapters later. After Paul has told Titus, you've got to ordain elders in every city. This is important. So you would think that Titus would just hang around Crete for many years, getting that job done. That's what I thought, okay? But no, look at Titus chapter 3, you know, verse, the same letter, brethren, okay? Verse 12, it says, When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, look at this, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Paul says, look, I need you in this city, Nicopolis. All right, I'm sending Artemis, I'm sending Tychicus, uh, but you need to come, be diligent, make sure you do this, put the effort in, you've got to come to me to this city. We need you over here now, Titus. And so Titus is like, well, hold on, you just told me I've got to ordain elders in every city here in Crete, but now you're telling me you need me somewhere else. You know why? Because serving the Lord, it's not, it's not this checklist. It's not like, all right, I've ordained elders in every city. Now I can go and travel somewhere else. Listen, God's work, there's so much to do. The laborers are few. <laughs> the laborers are few. And so, yes, Titus had a job to go and help Paul in another city, but he also had the responsibility of starting churches and ordaining elders in, other, in these other places. So these things are not mutually exclusive. You can do both these things. And you know what? As I said, you know, it requires me, I, I, can, I realize now that these, you know, even a man who's meant to, you think would be there to do the job that was left, and he will get the job done. I'm sure he did, right? But he's also 
asked to go and travel somewhere else. He was needed elsewhere. He was needed in another city. Look at verse number, let's keep going, verse number 9. 2 Timothy, uh, sorry, no, sorry. Oh yeah, so I wanted to read just quickly to you from 2, you don't need to turn there, you stay in Titus. But 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. And this is, this is the other letter that's written to another pastor, Timothy. And remember, it says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. So that's Paul writing to Timothy. He says, look, I need you in Rome. Come to Rome. Then he says, For Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to uh, Galatia, Titus to Dalm- Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And again, Timothy was pastoring the church at Ephesus. But even this time, he needed to go to Rome to help Paul in another city. Okay? And, Ty- and Timothy was also commanded to ordain elders. That was also his responsibility. And so it's not just you do one thing. You've got to do it all. <laughs> okay? All these responsibilities that we read in the epistles written to the pastors are things that pastors today should be considering and doing. Now, what this means is, brethren, is obviously if I'm going to have to travel somewhere... I'm not going to let this church fall apart. That would be highly irresponsible of me. That would damage my reputation, damage my testimony. It would damage people of God. It might let you, it probably let you down. And you might say, well, there's no point in church. You know, what's the point of serving God if we, we put so much effort into this and now it's all gone? It'd be highly irresponsible of me. It wouldn't be the act of a shepherd to just let a church fall apart. Okay? And so that's why my, my goal is to be up here because we have the ability to get up here every week. Now, that's something that I'm striving to do. But I just wanted to see you. Not only was Timothy required to go from city to city to help Paul sometimes when he had his own church, but so did Titus. And these are the only two men that are pastors. We read these past, sorry, pastoral epistles that are in specifically for pastors, and we see both of them requiring to do this. So it is a biblical thing to travel from one city to another city. And remember, when these guys are traveling, they don't have the cars and the planes. So they're there for a long time. They're there for several months. They're there to do a work. And so the first thing that we learn is there is a want of pastors. There is a lack of pastors. Now go to Titus. You're in Titus chapter 3. Let's keep reading there, verse number 12. So Titus is asked to go to another city. And then he says, When I, when I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, oh, I already read that bit. Be, anyway, I read Hebrew. Already. Be diligent to come unto me to... Uh, Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Then he says this, bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos, now we know Apollos, we've read about him before, on their journey diligently. So you've got to bring these guys along as well, he's saying, okay? But notice the next part of it, that nothing be wanting unto them. Nothing be wanting unto them. He says, look, when you're sending these two guys as well, right, Zenos and Apollos, you need to make sure when they go on their, on their journey to come and see me, you need to make sure they've got nothing wanting unto them. You've got to make sure all their needs are met, okay? And so the second uh, want, you know, things that are wanting that we need to uh, look at in this passage is a want of provision, a want of provision. You know, we can only accomplish so much depending on what the provisions are to the church, what we have to our, our, our abilities. You know, whether it's manpower, whether it's, it's uh, resources, whether it's, whether it's finances, we can only do so much depending on what we have. And if we send somebody somewhere, if we're causing people to travel from one place to another place, we need to make sure that there is nothing wanting. Now, in the early, uh, the early few months of starting Blessed Up Baptist Church, uh, Christina was giving birth, right? And I was, tra- I was the only preacher. I was traveling down to Sydney once a week. And then I needed Brother Jason. Remember that, Brother Jason? I needed you to get down to Sydney, okay? And uh, you know what? Praise God for Brother Jason. You know, that was, um, that was manpower that we could use to get down there to preach. But we had to make sure, even though we had less than what we have now, even financially less. We had to make sure that everything was taken care of. We had to make sure that there was nothing wanting, right? You know, that the, the flights were paid for. It wasn't coming out of his pocket. That when he got to Sydney, he knew what train to get on and he had, a, you know, he had the pass to get onto the train. That he had somebody wet, ready to pick him up, to give him a meal, to feed him, to give him a bed to sleep and for him to get back to the Sunshine Coast. Hey, that's right and that's proper. 
we send somebody somewhere for whatever reason. Hey, we wanted to send Brother Tim to Melbourne to do the soul winning marathon, you know, making sure that everything is provided for. But listen, we can only accomplish these things if the provisions are there. And you can see that Paul, you know, he's not like careless. He's not like, all right, guys, I need you to pack your bags and come over here. He says, look, we've got to make sure that everything's taken care of, okay? That there is nothing wanting to them, that they come in and they're being fed, they're being looked after, okay? And this is obviously, where's that coming from, though? Where is that provision coming from? Look at verse number 14. It says here, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Let's break down this verse a little bit. So you've got two groups of people here. Verse number 14, and let ours, so you've got your ours, and then at the end of the verse, that they be not unfruitful, the they and the ours. So you can see the two groups there in that one verse, right? And so what Paul is telling uh, Titus, and if I've said Timothy, I'm sorry, I get sometimes these two names mixed up. But what he has said to Titus is, look, there are ours, and these ours need to make sure they maintain good works, for, necess- for uh, necessary uses, okay? They're the ones that are going to be providing for they, right? They that are, sorry, uh, what's that passage? That they be not unfruitful. So when we send Zenus and Apollos, we want to make sure they're not unfruitful on their journey. We want to make sure it's successful. We want to make sure it's productive. But you need to make sure that ours, that, that's the, you know, our brethren, the churches that you're over are making sure that they're providing needs to these men that are traveling, okay? Things that are wanting. What are wanting? Number one, a want of pastors. There is a lack of pastors. I, I strongly encourage you, if you have a desire, you know, chase that. Ask the Lord, Lord, is this for me? Can you help me accomplish this? But number two, you know, when we are desiring to do these kinds of things, where we are sending people here and there, that their needs are being met, that they are being provided for, okay? I, I don't want to, you know, now, uh, you know, I, I don't say this to puff myself up or anything like this, but I, as I said, I went the first 15 months without getting paid. If we sent out a pastor to start a church, I don't want that pastor going 15 months without getting paid. It's not lovely, it's not nice, okay? It's not enjoyable, it's hard, in fact, okay? It eats into the savings a lot, all right? I want to make sure that that person is provided for. This is why I'm saying to you, if we have another well-grounded, established church down in Sydney, we've got more resources, we've got more manpower, we've got more everything to make sure that another church starts, you know, easier, that it's, it's easier on the people that are helping to start that church, that they are being taken care of. Now, can you please turn to Luke chapter 22? Luke chapter 22, verse number 35. Luke 22, verse 35. And when it said about these two men, Zenos and Apollos that were being sent, like it said, let nothing be wanting unto them. If your desire is to be a pastor and you think, man, how much money can I make? You're in the wrong profession. Right. Just start your own business. Okay? <laughs> start your own business. And even if your business collapses, the Lord's not going to be so upset with you. Okay? Instead of starting a church of God and just and doing it for the money. You're going to destroy yourself you're going to destroy God's people. So it's, you know, you, you go into full-time church ministry, not with a mindset of how much can I make, but the right mindset is, I want to make sure that there's nothing wanting. And, you know, and, and my goal one day is to get to a point where I can not need anything. That, you know, just serving the Lord full-time is taking care of every need. That I don't have to draw resources from other things and other, you know, other places that I have uh, resources with. That it will come from the local church because that is the right way to do things. Okay? So it's not about how much can I make. It's just make, making sure that, hey, my family's fed. Making sure that there's a roof over our heads. Making sure that we're comfortable enough to serve the Lord. It's, you know, it's not about how rich you are. I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be poor. I just want to make sure that the Lord takes care of me and anybody else that we put into the ministry. That they're being taken care of. A want of provision. But like I said, we are limited by what we have. We are limited by people. We are limited by uh, resources. And this is why we have to be careful. You know, take one step at a time. It's not about going crazy. It's not about rushing this, this project. It's doing things as we can, okay? One step at a time. Now, you're in Luke 22, verse 35. 
These are the words of Jesus. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip, scrip is like a bag of things, and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. So there was a time when God sent his disciples out there, his apostles, to do his work, preach the gospel. And, and Jesus said, Look, don't take anything with you. You'll be taken care of. Everything will be provided. And they, they come back, Yeah, we've lacked nothing. Okay? Now, you could look at that and be driven to say, well, you know what? That's for me. I'm just going to quit my job. I'm just going to give up everything. And I'm just going to go serve the Lord because God, look, nothing was lacking. But look, that was for a specific time. Because as we keep reading, verse number 36, it says, Then said he unto them, But now, so things have changed. But now, he that have a purse, let him take it. You got money? Take your money. Okay? And likewise, his scrip. You got a bag of clothes and things? Take that as well. And, the, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Hey, you need defense. You need protection. You need security. You need safety. Verse number 37. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. Now look at verse number 38. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. It is enough. So what do we learn here? We learn now that, yes, there was a time when Jesus was walking the earth. He made sure that as they went out preaching the gospel, their needs were being met. But from the time before Christ was crucified till now, till, till the very end, you know, we do need resources. We do need the purse and the scrip and the, and the swords. We do need the resources to send people to do works for God. We can't expect them to just step out and, well, hopefully God will provide. No, we need to make sure they're being taken care of. Okay? And so what I'm saying to you, brethren, is this. We are limited with what we have. These, these disciples, they found two swords. The Lord said, is in, it is enough. So what do we learn there? We, we, have, we look at the resources that we have at New Life Baptist Church, and hopefully, eventually, New, uh, Blessed Up Baptist Church, we look at the resources, we look at the manpower, we look at the finances, and then we make a decision, hey, are we able to start a third church? But we're not going to be doing that, brethren. I'm telling you, well, you know, until we have a pastor in place. Until there's a second full-time pastor in place, we can't take that step just yet because it's, honestly, it's just too much for me. Okay, even though it's my goal, it's too much for me at this point in time. Okay, but we are limited by what we have. Now, please go to John chapter 6, verse number 5. John chapter 6 and verse number 5. And I, I love this story. I love this story. Because we are a small church. You know, even though our resources have increased, even though we're doing better, you know, and people are giving financially more, we're still, you know, in comparison to other churches, we still are a small church, right? But in John chapter 6, verse 5, we have a very encouraging story. It says in verse number 5, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, answered him, uh, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here, which have five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Hey, you know what? New Life Baptist Church, we're like five barley loaves and two fishes. And you might ask the question, but what are we amongst so many? That, you know, that we have a population of 21 million in Australia, Pastor Kevin. You think New Life Baptist Church can reach them all? Well, we've got five loaves. <laughs> we've got two fishes, you know? And, and the story here, of course, is the feeding of the 5,000. There's no way you can feed 5,000 people. You can't feed my family with, with, with this. There's not enough fish, okay? There's not enough bread to feed my family. And God uses this, as little as it is, to be able to feed 5,000 people. Now look at verse number 10. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Look, the, the men were about 5,000. What about the women and the children? You could easily, it could easily be 10,000 people. We don't know, okay? The men was 5,000. Verse number 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples 
to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So God is able to do a miracle. Jesus can take what is little and make much of it. Okay, he can feed 5,000. Brethren, we can reach Australia. Amen. Maybe even New Zealand. It's not that far away. I don't, I don't know what God can accomplish with this church. But I believe God can do this. You know, we don't just read these stories, oh, it's lovely, 5,000 were met. This is for us. This is for us to say, well, God, you can take little, hey, you can take little New Life Baptist Church and you can cause us to feed 5,000 people. You can cause us to, to see 5,000 people saved. You can cause us to start, you know, all these churches in other cities. God can do this if we give Him thanks. We give Him thanks for the fishes that we do have. We give Him thanks for the barley loaves that we do have. Give Him thanks. Jesus can multiply the effort. Jesus can multiply the work. You know, if, if Blessed Up Baptist Church down there has a full-time pastor, you know, both churches have full-time pastors, a, a church that's similar in size, hey, that's double the work that we could do alone for Australia. We get a third church that has triple the work that we could do. You know, God can do great things through us. Through us. Okay? Now, please go to 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And by the way, I realize I'm harping on about resources and finances. I'm not saying to you that we need more finances. I'm not saying to you, hey, dig in deep and... I'm not, that's not what I'm preaching today. I'm just preaching the Bible. And you see, this is an important part, though, of accomplishing the works that God has given us. I believe God has given us what we need to, to accomplish what we need right now. Okay? I'm, not here, I'm not saying, hey, guys, let's do a faith offering right now. Pass the plate around. Right? That's, not what I'm pre- that's not why I'm preaching this. I just want you to see what is needed to make sure that the work of God gets done. All right? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8. We don't want to be like the Corinthian church. We know how messed up this church was. This is what Paul says to this church in 2 Corinthians eleven eight. 8. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. How embarrassing. Right? How embarrassing. How embarrassing if, if, you know, if New Life Baptist Church could not afford to pay this pastor wages and I needed to go to some other churches and ask them wages. That would be like robbing other churches to do your service. Now, thank God we're not in that situation, okay? But let's keep going. Verse number nine. And when I was present with you and wanted, wanted, hey, he was lacking things. Paul was lacking. Paul came to the Corinthian church to serve them, and he was lacking. I don't know what he was lacking exactly, okay? Maybe food, maybe a place to stay. Who knows, right? He says, but then he says this, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. So Paul says, look, you know what? I'm going pro- to make sure that I can provide for myself. But not only that, but the church in Macedonia has made sure they've provided so we can serve the Corinthian church. You know why he says that? He doesn't say that. To, you know, some people take these passages to say, see, pastors and church leaders, they don't need to get paid. No, Paul is saying this to embarrass the church. Hey, you've not done right. In fact, I have to go and rob other churches. Now, he didn't have to rob other churches. He didn't steal money, okay? But it is like doing that because the church in Corinthians was, make, was not providing the needs of Paul to do the service unto them. Now, thank God we're not in that situation. And you know what? When you started Blessed Up Baptist Church, I've never robbed from one church to another church to do them service. Never. I've never, you know, taken finances from here to make sure the church over there is covered. No, when I went down to start the church over there, it was out of my own pocket. Hey, when I started this church over here, it was out of my own pocket. And eventually, that was reimbursed. And eventually, hey, the finances of that church was able to provide for itself. Thank God that there's enough coming from this church to take care of the needs here, that we don't have to rob another church. Thank God there's enough coming through, blessed up this church, that we don't have to rob some other church. Hey, but there was a time where I had to be like Paul and make sure that, hey, I had the resources, I had the finances to make sure the early days that things were covered, that things were taken care of. Again, I'm not boasting of that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying anything like that. I'm not, not trying to lift myself up. It's just, I don't want that to be on somebody else. Like, the day that I send somebody from this church, 
or we ordain a man somewhere, I want to make sure they've got something. <laughs> you know, that they've got the resources available to them, to, them to, to give everything they can to the Lord. Now, if you can please turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 15. Now, even though I don't want to rob from any church, it is biblical if, you, if one church was helping another church. I'm not saying that's wrong or unbiblical. It's just, it's not ideal. It's not the ideal scenario, okay? But Philippians chapter 4, verse number 15. Again, just in case there's a mentality. Now, I don't know. Maybe everybody here is like, wow, we can't wait for you to get down there, Pastor Kevin. You know, we can't wait for you to just serve the brethren there, to do a good work there. We're praying for you. We can't wait to hear the reports. Maybe that's the case. But I also know human nature. And I know human nature because I'm a human. I know our sin nature because I have a sin nature. I know the flesh of man because I have the flesh. And I know when it comes to money, I've been in church long enough for people to, to, to see how people argue and fight over this stupid money. It's needed. It's needed. But, you know, when people argue about this, it's crazy. All right? Look at Philippians 4.15. This is how I want New Life Baptist Church to be known. It says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. He says to the Philippian church, look, when I was traveling from Macedonia, no other church even asked me, hey, do you need finances? Do you need help? Can we help you in your work? Except you. The Philippian church was the only one willing to help in the work. Look at verse number 16. And even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. So he's serving the church in Thessalonica, and the Philippian church is providing the resources, you know, what he needs. So there's nothing unbiblical with that, okay? But... Here's the thing, we're not taking financial resources from New Life Baptist Church to serve the church down there. That's not happening. But we are giving up manpower. We are giving up the pastor to get down there, okay? And the, the reason we're doing this is, look at verse number 17, not because I desire a gift. And I really want this to rest in your heart. It says, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account, to your account, Brethren, me going down there for 12 months, okay, we're going to be able to do more for God. We're going to train up the soul winning. We're going to be, improve the soul winning efforts out there, okay? And I'm, I'm thankful for the guys that are out soul winning. Hey, but we can do better. We can train more people. We can make sure we have a clear presentation that people are definitely getting saved, okay? We're going to, I'm going to put that effort in there, especially in the soul winning. The reason we're doing that, though, even though we're giving up resources from this church, is that fruits may abound to your account, to the account of this church. What an amazing thing, brethren, that we can go to heaven, not just for the souls we got saved, not just for the work that we've done, but if we helped another church, we've helped other brethren in another place to abound in their fruits, in their soul winning efforts, it's going to come on your account. You're going to go to heaven and God's going to say, hey, here's the rewards for you saving me. And by the way, when you sent Pastor Kevin to Sydney, He's, he's double that because they were able to get out there and do some great works because you're afforded that. You, you've given to that work. Amen. And we can, like I said, yeah, finances, but it's manpower that we're giving to, this, to the church down there. It's sending me down there to be a full-time pastor. I want this to rest in your heart, okay? You're going to be rewarded by God, you know, because I, I, I promise you, maybe it's already crossed your mind or it will cross your mind. You're going to be like, Pastor Kevin's deserted us. Where is he? Three months into it, you know, Oh, man, why did he go? Hey, listen, there is fruit ab abounding on your account, okay? There's eternal rewards for you allowing your pastor to go and do this work, all right? Okay, let's keep going for some uh, 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God, now, I want you to look at verse number 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Many times this verse is read by itself, that Christ and God will provide all our needs. Praise God for that. But let's not remove it from the context of what we just read. Why will God supply all your need? Brethren, I know you want your needs taken care of. And you know what? God will provide all your need if you're willing to give to other churches, if you're willing to give to other brethren in Australia, if you're willing to give up 
your pastor, your time, your resources, your finances to help other people, if you're willing to help the needs of others, God will provide all your need. Hey, that's a promise from the Lord. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. What a guarantee. What a guarantee. That's one of the biggest concerns we all have, making sure all our needs are met. Well, hey, start giving to the work of God. You know, start providing whatever it is that you can provide. Like I said, you might not have the finances. Hey, the manpower, your resources, your, your availability, your love, your prayers, your encouragement. All of this is a sacrifice that you can give to the Lord God. Things that are wanting. Things that are wanting. Now, can you please turn to Jeremiah chapter 23? I'm almost done. Jeremiah chapter 23. The sermon's going longer than I thought. <laughs> Always the case with me. All right, you guys go to Jeremiah 23. I do have a third point. The third point is actually in Hosea. And uh, just a reminder as to why I'm going down there. Yes, to establish the church. Uh, yes, to, to help with the soul winning efforts down there. Uh, but in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, you guys go to Jeremiah 23. In Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So the next want is a want or a lack of knowledge. I don't want God's people destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You know, the reason I put so much effort in my preaching, you know, I might, I might not be the best deliverer. I know my grammar's not great. <laughs> my kids correct me. <laughs> I, know, I know my presentation's not always great. But I don't think you can doubt my passion and my love for the church and for the Word of God, okay? And for the time I spend working on it, right? Because I don't want us to be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I want us to grow in knowledge, okay? But God's people in the time of Hosea were destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. And thou shalt be no priest to me. Speaking to the, to the nation of Israel, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. You know, we, we learn about this in the book of Revelation, that Jesus Christ can come and take away the candlestick. You know, if the church is just not doing what God wants them to do. And one thing that the Lord wants our church to have, not to be lacking in, is in knowledge. You know, and I've spent the last three years trying my best to give you my knowledge of the Bible. And you know, there are, there are things that I really want to preach, but I'm, just, I'm like, not yet, not yet. Okay, it's not nothing unusual, nothing unusual, but I know there are just some more foundational things that we always need to put in place, all right, for, for some greater things to be understood. There are some things that I'm learning that I'm still trying to put together, and I realize that one day it's coming, and I expect, but when I come back in 12 months, uh, you're going to notice an, an improvement even in the, in the teaching that I give you, okay? Because I think we're at a different stage by then, okay? But the church in Sydney needs that knowledge. The church in Sydney needs some help in that area, okay? And so my goal, I don't want the people down there, I don't want God's people to be destroyed by a lack of knowledge. I want to train up men. Hey, there are men there that want to preach. There are men that one day may want to serve the Lord as a deacon, as a pastor, and they need help. They need somebody to come alongside them and give them the knowledge because I don't want that church to be destroyed, okay? A lack of knowledge, a want of knowledge. So I'm going there to provide training as well, okay? It's not just to run services, but to give those men training, you know, whether it's in soul winning, also in the preaching of God's Word, the study of God's Word. I want to give them, I want to pass on this knowledge. Now, in conclusion, in conclusion, you're in Jeremiah 23, verse 3. Uh, it says here, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and I will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And so the Lord's promising that He's going to take His people that are scattered and bring them to their folds. Let's take the concept of a church. You know, this church, in Life Baptist Church, is your fold. You know, God's brought you from different places, different backgrounds, different areas of the Sunshine Coast and surrounding areas to be part of this fold. Why? That they shall be fruitful and increase. That's why. But look at verse number four. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Look at this. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So what did we start with? The title of the sermon tonight was Things That Are Wanting. Or you could say Things That Are Lacking. You know what God wants? He wants every fold to not be lacking anything. Neither shall they be lacking. 
But what does he need them to have? A shepherd that will be over them, a shepherd that will feed them. Okay? And the role of a pastor is so important. So important to feed the pe- people of God, the Word of God. You know? To make sure that we're entire, wanting nothing. You know, to be complete, to be perfect. You know, this church still has place to grow, a place to grow, but it's well established. It's well established. We have faithful men. We have good men. I'm thankful for every man, every lady, every child that makes up this church, every member that makes up this church. I'm thankful for all of you. I love all of you. I'm also thankful for the men that are down there in Sydney. They need their pastor. They need somebody watching over them. They need direction. You know, the Lord doesn't want them to be lacking anything. And, you know, I didn't know this going into it when we started the church in Sydney. I wasn't expecting to feel this way. But I realized, man, what a huge responsibility I've taken. <laughs> All right? Oh, Pastor Kevin, it's your fault. Yeah, I guess. But you guys helped me. You pushed me along as well. <laughs> it's all our responsibility. Hey, they're brethren that love us. Hey, we love them. We want to make sure they're taken care of. We want to make sure that one day they have a full-time pastor. And I can't wait for the future where we can work together and maybe start another church, a third church, a fourth church, a fifth church in all the major cities in Australia. But hey, things that are wanting. There are things that are are lacking. There are things that we need to take care of. It's not that that's bad. It's just that that's part of growth. As you grow, you you know, you can accomplish more. And what do we need? We need to make sure that there are men that are prepared to step in one day as a pastor. Please be thinking about it. I'm talking to all the men right now. You're not all going to be pastors. The Lord doesn't want you all to be pastors. Okay, but you may have a desire and, and you've got to put the work in. You've got to put the effort in. You've got to grow in love for God, for the Bible, for the people of God. I wish I didn't have as much love for the people of God because it kind of hurts. You know, when I hear people that have, are in a, some, some area, they've got no church. I'm like, I just want to get a church out there. <laughs> but I know um, we're not there yet. We haven't, it's not the right time. We haven't got the resources. We have other things that we need to take care of. You know, so it's, it's one step at a time. It's one step at a time. Things that are wanting. We need to make sure that we're, we're mindful, that we pay attention to God, that he, he leads us, that we make every decision based on the Word of God. We see the examples that we see in the Bible. We follow after those things and we take care. And, you know, the, the end goal, brethren, is to make sure that every fold of God, every church, is an entire, is entire wanting nothing. Okay, let's pray.